Section 5.7. There are still some word problems in here, but there's also this brand new thing at the beginning that we haven't had before. The idea of if you know that two variables vary directly, inversely, or if you have three variables, that there's some kind of joint variation going on. So first varying directly, um, like y varies directly with x, or sometimes phrased as y is directly proportional to x. That would happen if there's some non-zero number k such that y equals k times x. So like this. Um, and it is okay if the k is negative, that'll occasionally come up. Um, then y varies inversely um, or is inversely proportional or y varies indirectly. Sometimes you see it phrased that way too, but our book uses inversely, so I'll stick with that. Um, so there you have the x in the denominator. So um, that's basically the main difference from how you would set them up. So you'd be told something like y varies inversely with x and y equals 45 when x is 20. So then what's y when x is 35? And then you can solve for k and you'd be able to get an equation where the k was actually a number and then you can sub in to get the second part. And that's basically what you end up doing. Um, joint variation involves three variables. So like it says there, y varies jointly with x and z if there's a non-zero number k such that y equals k times x times z. So you can have that. So if it says varies jointly, that means that uh, basically y varies directly with both variables, right? So varies directly with x, varies directly with z. Um, you could have something like y varies directly with x and indirectly with z at the same time, although that doesn't come up for the problems that we've got in the homework. You won't see it. Um, but yeah, it's possible. Um, and then k does have a name. It's called either the constant of proportionality or constant of variation. I've heard it more as the constant of proportionality, but realistically those terms are interchangeable. All right, so getting into how this works. So number one, y varies directly. So that's the key word with x. And then y is seven when x is 15. So from there, we would need to figure out y when x is 12. Okay, so the first sentence by itself, leaving out the find y when x is 12 part, the first sentence would be enough to solve for k. Once you solve for k, then you do the second sentence. So we know if there's direct variation, then we should have that y is equal to k times x, right? That's just from varying directly. You should get something that looks like that. But then we also know that y is 7 when x is 15. And that would actually allow us to solve for k. Because if we sub in, we'll have that 7 equals k times 15. But then if you divide both sides by 15, it looks like that means that k is going to be 7 over 15. And that's because it is. So we're going to end up with that y is equal to 7 fifteenths x. So that's the first part, right? Now we've got our equation where k is solved for, and then we can use that to get the second part. So we've got that y is 7 fifteenths x. And then to sub in, I guess I can do the second part in a second color. Why not? So then we're just going to sub in 12. So when x equals 12, then we're going to have that y is equal to 7 fifteenths times 12. So then y would be equal to 84 over 15, which actually does simplify a little bit. Both of those numbers are divisible by 3. So Let's see, 84 is 3 times 28. And then 15 is 5 times 3. So then we could say, well, then this is 28 over 5. And that is the answer when it's simplified down. Since 28 certainly not divisible by 5, so we can't do anything else. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out is... You could simplify when you, when you just have it as 7 times 12 all over 15, and then to factor the 12 and factor the 15, and then you can cancel the 3s out from there. That's probably easier to see. Um, but if you get it to the 84 over 15, and you think, I can see it in the 15, but seeing it in the 84 is a little tough, there's a trick for divisibility by 3, which is if you add the digits together, then if that number is divisible by 3, then so is your original number. 
So like for 84, 8 plus 4 is 12. That's divisible by 3, so therefore so is 84. That doesn't work for divisibility by everything, but it works for divisibility by 3. It actually also works for divisibility by 9, because um, 3 is the only prime factor in 9. So like if you have digits that add up to 9, um, or um, a multiple of 9, right, then the original number is divisible by 9. But um, it comes in handy more for 3. So here... The 84, if you're not used to seeing that one and thinking right off the bat, oh, that's divisible by 3, that's how you can check. You add up the digits, and if that number is divisible by 3, so is the original number. So that might come in handy. I figured it was at least worth bringing it up. All right, then number 2 varies inversely this time, of course, right? So you'd think we're going to have one of each, which we are. Um, so y varies inversely with x, and then when x is 4, y is negative 12, and then we'll deal with the find y when x is equal to 16 in a little bit. So it varies inversely. That means that we should have that y equals k over x. And then we know that when x is 4, y is negative 12. All right, so then negative 12 would have to be equal to k over 4. But then if we multiply both sides by 4, so 4 times negative 12 equals 4 times k over 4, then we're going to get that negative 48 is equal to k. So then that means that y is equal to, I guess you could write it as negative 48 over x, or if you want to write that negative out front, the negation of 48 over x, I think that would be a little more conventional. Um, all right, so we've got that y is equal to the negation of 48 over x, and then what about when x equals 16? I guess I'll change the color back. And I'll say that when x equals 16, then we should have that y equals the negation of 48 over 16. But 48 over 16 is 3. So y is equal to negative 3. And that is our answer. All right, so we've had one direct, one inverse, and then it's going to be one joint variation, of course. So if R varies jointly with S and T, and then we have our initial condition that when R is 12, S is 8, and T is 3. And so we want to find R when S is 14, T is 6. So it varies jointly. That would mean that R would have to be equal to K times S times T. And then we know that when R is 12, S is 8, and T is 3. So 12 is equal to K times 8 times 3. So that means 12 is equal to 24k. And then if we divide both sides by 24, then we're going to get that 12 over 24 equals k, but we might as well reduce that to lowest terms. That's 1 half. So 1 half is equal to k, so that means that r is equal to 1 half times s times t, like that. We've got our k solved for and then we're just going to have to sub in, just like before. So r is 1 half st, and then when s is 14 and t is 6, so when s equals 14 and t equals 6, then we're going to get that r is 1 half times 14 times 6, which should work out to 42, since 1 half times 14 is 7, so then r must be 7 times 6, so r is 42. There we go. All right, so joint variation, even though it's got the extra variable, it doesn't really end up being anything that different, really, right? It's just one more thing to sub in for. Um, it doesn't really make things more complicated. Um, the word problems might feel more complicated just because they're word problems. But we end up doing things that are fairly similar just with the extra context added in. So if the voltage in an electric current, or electric circuit, rather, is held constant, then the current, I, varies inversely with the resistance, R. Um, I guess, just for completeness' sake, why is current I instead of C? Because uh, C is usually reserved for things that are constants, and the I stands for intensity, basically. Um, I think it's in French, but if you look at the French word for intensity, it looks very similar to the English, right? Which, I mean, that's not 
surprising, right? It's a romance language that happens. Um, so that's, that's why it's I. It's, it stands for intensity. Um, and it varies inversely, right? So that's an important word. And then we have if I is 60 when R is 150, find I when R is 120, right? That's basically what that last part is saying, right? So that, that second sentence, if you take the context out, it's saying if I equals 60 when R equals 150, then what is I when R equals 120? All right, that's what we're being asked, really. All right, so we, we should be able to solve this, right? So I varies inversely with R. Well, if it varies inversely, it must look like this, that I equals K over R, and we just gotta figure out that K. So I is 60, and then we'll have K over 150. And if we solve for K, we're gonna multiply both sides by 150. K is pretty big here. So we're gonna have 150 times 60 equals K, but 150 times 60 is 9,000. So then what we've got is that I is equal to, oops, that, that is the K, I'm writing too fast. So it's 9,000 over R. All right, so there we go, we got K solved for. And then what is I when R is 120? Well, we know that I is 9,000 over R, so we just have to sub in the 120 for R, and we should be just about good to go. So we'll have 9,000 over 120, so that's 900 over 12, which I think is 75. Yeah, all right, so I ends up being 75, and I guess I should put the units in of amperes. And there we go, there's our current. All right, so even though it's a word problem, the solving is pretty similar. Um, and if you don't see what to do right away, I mean, you can try to do the thing that I have in maroon up toward the top, where you just try to write that sentence with all the context out and just try to write it just mostly with variables and numbers. And then it kind of turns into things that look like number one, number two, and number three. Um, so that's how I organize this in my brain is I, I think, okay, if I took all the context out, what does this look like? And then I go, okay, I know how to do that. So um, that works for me. And if you think that'll work for you, that's worth a try if you get stuck, right? Um, number five, I believe is a joint variation. Oh, yes, it is. Since it, it says it right there, it varies jointly. Um, so kinetic energy of a moving object varies jointly with its mass in the square of its velocity. Oh, look at this. Square. All right. So when I write this out, um, I'm not going to have E equals K times M times V. I'm going to have E equals K times M times V squared, since it says the square of the velocity. Right? So I've got a square V in that formula. Um, and then the second sentence, um, I guess we want to convert that into context-free wording. Um, I guess that second sentence basically is saying that um, if m equals 25 and v equals 10, then we know that e is 1275. And then the second part of that would be that if v equals 15, what is E? And notice it doesn't specify a mass for that second part. That's because it's the same, right? If it's the same object, it's going to have the same mass. So that's why it doesn't get specified the second time. It's going to be 25 again. So I guess I can put that in parentheses maybe as a different color. So here, M equals 25. All right. So first things first, um, we know that E is 1275 
if m oops i missed the seven if e is 25 and or if m is 25 and v is 10 so 1275 equals k times 25 times 10 squared right we got to square that velocity so 1275 then would be k times 25 times 100 so then that's 1275 equals 2500 k and then to solve for k we'd have to divide both sides by 2500 so 1275 over 2500 is equal to k um, you could reduce that fraction but it might be easier with this one just to go straight to the decimal because the decimal actually looks pretty nice it terminates pretty quickly so it's 0.51 ends up being k and i think here it's easier just to use the decimal so then we'll just say that e equals 0.51 times m times v squared like that um, and if you were going to write the decimal as a fraction you'd end up with 51 over 100 and you would get that because 1275 and 2500 are both divisible by 25 and that's how you get there but i think that's easier with the decimal and then we want to know what e is if v is 15. all right so i'll just rewrite our formula that e is 0.51 times mv squared and now we're saying well what if v is 15. so we'd have 0.51 times 25 for the mass and then times 15 squared and then 15 squared is 225 so we'll have 0.51 times 25 times 225 and this is probably the point where you want to use a calculator you don't get an integer for this what you're going to end up with is 2868.75 and then i guess i can put the units in here joules so that is going to be the kinetic energy with that increased velocity right to where it's um it's 15 instead of 10. Um, and then if you look at this and you go that's a big difference because when it was the velocity was 10 it was only 1275 and now it's you know almost 2900 and when it's 15 that seems like a big jump yeah but the velocity is being squared right so that makes that change really big um and that's what we're seeing right um, it looks pretty big so all right i guess that would cover um everything that i think would show up here i didn't do a word problem that was a direct variation because i figured that was probably the easiest one um, and if i was going to leave something out that would be the one to leave out but i think there are six questions from 5.7 and we just did five so that ought to basically cover everything although i think you might get a a direct word problem but that would I, th I would think that would be easier than like a, a joint one or or an indirect one so um, that should then basically cover it for 5.7 I think